Thank you for joining us today. This is the Federal Programs Office Hours on the Timeline and Allowability. So to start with, if you could sign in um, in the chat, give us your name and what school district you're with, that would really help us. That way we have a record of who is um, here and, and who's getting the information and, and lets us know whether it's worth doing these or not. So I am Beth Wooster. I am the ESCA Federal Programs Administrator, and I'm going to have the rest of the team introduce themselves and let you know which districts or which uh, ESU areas they work with, and then we will get through all of this. So, Dottie, I'm going to start with you. Thanks, Beth. Uh, Dottie Hoisman. I am the Assistant Administrator for Federal Programs and the Title I uh, Director, and this year I'm working with ESU 19 and ESU 3 area, and of course, occasionally others as needed. Hi, I'm Julie Otero. I'm with the Federal Programs team, and I also work with Title 3, and I work with ESU 7 this year, and um, ESU 13. I'm Michelle Rezek, and I get to work with ESU 1, 5, and 8. Good morning. I'm Ann Carmony. Um, I work with uh, ESU 10, 16, uh, and LPS, and then I also do all of the homeless stuff, so I'm the McKinney-Vento coordinator. Good morning, I'm Tate Tateman. I work with Title II, Title IV. I'm the private school ombudsman and I work with ESUs 2, 9, 11, and 15. And I'm Benjamin Zink, Title I, Part C, Education and Migratory Children. Rhonda? Good morning, I'm Rhonda Reek, Federal Programs Office Associate. And Janice? Janice Paling. Um, I have a financial background. I'm new to the federal programs team and I'm kind of doing a little bit of everything. No. Um, and Ann Hubble's at another meeting, so she wasn't able to join us. But we're a small team, but we are here to help you any way we can. So uh, the purpose of today's sessions, we're going to go through that real quick. Um, we're going to share the timelines. Um, we've come up with a document that will hopefully help guide you. Um, we're going to share some ideas regarding the different allowabilities from the different programs, uh, discuss the transferability, then answer some of the uh, ESSA allowability questions, and we also have some reminders of some timelines that are or some deadlines that are coming up. So we have just a few things, and then if there's anyone that needs some extra support on their ESSA applications, we can go into breakout rooms and help you individually if needed. So. All right, the very first thing we're going to talk about is the timelines. So we came up with a document to hopefully help um, with this so that you know when things are due and what's coming up and it'll help you for planning. So I'm going to put it in the chat real quick where you can find this document. It's on our federal programs web page. So this screenshot shows um, where it's highlighted in pink. It's about halfway down the page and it says federal programs timeline. It's gonna open up the document that I just linked in the, the chat, um, but that way hopefully you can get to it later on. And in this, we have it starting in July since that's what our fiscal year starts is July to, uh, actually July, September, but we've just run it July through August. And so it'll kind of give you a heads up of what's coming up and what you'll need to do. Now, not everything applies to every single district. Um, for example, comparability, that's only for about 30 districts in the state. So there's some things that you may get to that don't necessarily affect your district, but um, there's hyperlinks and there's things that'll help you walk through the different um, things. There's like on comparability in October, if you hit it, it has a list of the districts that actually have to complete it and then the, the, the direction. So um, I guess take some time, look at this. If things change, we will update this document, but this is pretty much the standard um, for every single year. Sometimes grants open a little late or a little early, but this is um, 
basically when it, it does. Right now, we've got the ESSA consolidated that's due the end of September. And then we'll be having, uh, I think, RLIS grant just opened up. The migrant grant opens up October 1st. So there's a lot going on on our team. Um, and, and so we are always here to help you. Um, but this this should at least give you a, a heads up. So um, the next page. Yeah, that would be me for Title II. Um, so just as, as a reminder with Title IIA, the information on this slide tells you what the purposes are for Title IIA, and that's actually on an overview page on the ESSA grant for Title II. So you can see the purpose is to help student achievement. Um, to help student achievement, we all know that kids don't come to us and just learn because they're in the classroom and we have a teacher who says things over and over again. We want to make sure that we give good PD to staff. So the way you give good PD to staff is continuing to help support them in areas of focus that they may need, that the entire school may need, and maybe the entire district may need. So you're improving the quality and effectiveness of the teachers. It, it also includes support for principals and other school leaders maybe a reading coach, um, paraprofessionals, things like that. Um, you can use the money to help support all of those, um, those various groups with pro professional development. Now, if you go to the next slide and we look at the professional de development, it really is a lot of times districts and even some non-publics that we'll talk about in a minute, look for the newest shiniest object or the newest shiniest workshop to go to. So, oh, there's a workshop on fill in the blank. And you go, oh, and a teacher comes to you and says, oh, I really wanna go to that. And you're thinking, well, do I have the money to send them? And you're thinking, oh, we have Title II PD money. Well, yes, but no. You really need to think about the fact that it shouldn't be the shiniest object. It should be, does it match the, the continuous improvement plan? Does it match if we have a reading goal? Is there something in there that's that's based on reading? And would it be, is it research-based? Is it a great workshop? Or is it just one of those things that was shiny and it looks like a fun thing to go to? You might also want to think about the safety plan. Do you have a safety plan and you, um, you know, you want to send teachers for professional development? Um, that can be with Title II. Um, will it benefit the majority of the teachers? If you're sending one teacher to something and they're not coming back and sharing any of that knowledge with the rest of the staff, then you've only professionally grown one teacher that's gonna affect those 20 some kids in the class or 80 kids that come to them in maybe middle school or, or, or senior high. So you really need to think through that if we send one teacher or two teachers, then are they gonna come back and train the rest of the teachers and help support those teachers? Or if it's a reading coach, will the reading coach get the most out of it and then come back and provide professional development to the rest of the staff? Reminder to always stay within the continental USA for training. Um, a lot of times um, we'll look at a workshop and let's say there's um, workshop locations are maybe Omaha and um, somewhere in Missouri and maybe somewhere in Texas and somewhere in California and maybe even Hawaii. Okay, think about what's reasonable and necessary. So reasonableness in that situation would be to send teachers to Omaha. And if those dates don't work, then, make, then you'd look at Missouri um, travel. So you really want to think about keeping um, the cost reasonable and make sure it's necessary and make sure that you can defend. So if you didn't send teachers to Omaha, why didn't you send the teachers to the Omaha workshop? Be able to defend why you did or didn't do that. And next slide. So Title II for non-public schools. Um, these funds can only, so I'm going to say that a couple times, only be used for non-public professional development. Okay. Now, again, it can't be something shiny. It should be something worthwhile that matches some sort of a plan that they have in place. It's exactly like what I just talked about with the public schools. They're all, um, there's also a piece that it says it must be secular, non-ideological, and neutral. Okay. So if a, the non-public comes to you and says that there's a really good Christian reading conference in Des Moines that they want to attend, Okay, you're going to have to make sure that you work with the non-public to look at the conference registration to see what pieces of it are secular and that you can pay for. So, for example, if the non-public is attending in Des Moines and the opening is a prayer service, it's an hour long 
church service. And then during lunch, there's an hour long speaker on various um, non secular topics. You would have to work with the non public to determine what percentage of that conference could be paid for. And that would be conference paid for for travel expenses. So if 60% of the conference is secular, it would be 60% of travel costs could be paid. That would include driving. That would include any sort of a stipend maybe that they want to pay the teacher. It was would also include travel, um, the hotel um, and the registration for the conference. So that's how that would work for the non-public. Um, just remember, they need to follow the same requirements as you guys do. So it's okay to say to that non-public, talk to us about what your plan is. Why did you decide to send teachers to this conference? How does it match your school improvement plan? And then consultation, can't say it enough. Consultation is absolutely critical for the public to visit with a non-public if the non-public is spending money in, in PD. And Tate, I'm going to put you on the spot right now. Um, Tate knew I was going to call on him, but he didn't know what I was going to say ahead of time. Tate, do you want to add anything since you are the Nebraska's ombuds? Um, for the most part, you covered all the major things, but just to kind of, for people to know my role is my role is to work with both the private schools and the public schools when you might have questions. So like as Dottie was going through some of those things, maybe, you know, the private schools ask some questions you're not quite sure about, feel free to go ahead and give me a call, send me an email, and I can help you determine if something's allowable or not. And that really goes for any of our programs. You know, feel free to email any of our staff. But anything with the private schools, I'm the ombudsman, so I work with both sides, and I have a lot of experience working with both private and public schools, so I can be helpful in that role. Thank you, Tate. I did have a public school at one point that sent me a, it was a pretty lengthy um, conference um, book of all of the sessions that the non-public, or it was an entire conference that the non-public teachers were going to. And they're like, can you tell us what percentage of this can be paid? Okay, not really our job to do that. That would be something you can work on with, the public should work with the non-public because maybe they didn't attend this this uh, conference piece or that session that was that was uh, non-secular. Maybe they attended one that was appropriate to pay for. So you just have to work together to come up with that percentage. Thanks, Tate, for adding. And next slide. And then the other use of Title II funds, and this is for only public, so non-public cannot use this. The other piece that's allowable um, besides the PD um, for the public is to um, class size reduction. So CSR is what we call it. But you really, really need to think about this. This is not a, we're going to, you need to make sure you're not supplanting on this one. So let me explain. All of a sudden it's like, oh, we have some extra Title II dollars. So we're going to take Mrs. Jones in third grade and we're going to move her salary to Title II. Okay, is Mrs. Jones a new teacher and are you are you breaking up the class because it's too big of a class or it's a very needy class um, or maybe um, you you want to just help support those kids think through is that an additional teacher or are we just trying to move the money from district funding to federal funding that's not allowed out, allowable that would be supplant uh, supplanting. But if you've got a class, let's say, and a lot of people do this with their class size reduction money, all of a sudden they're having an influx of kindergartners. Well, those kindergartners then become first graders, and then become second graders and on. So what they end up doing is they hire an additional kindergarten teacher, and then that teacher rotates to first grade with them in second grade and third grade. And that's very appropriate to do. That would be, that would be supplementing, not supplanting. Now, our requirements for class size reduction have to be one of the following. It's limited to K-2 schools. And would somebody check me and make sure it's K-2 and not K-3? Because in the back of my mind, I was thinking it was three. Um, limited to K-2 to K two schools. It's three. Okay, should be K-3 schools. Identified as needs improvement. So you're on the CSI, that school is, the ATSI list. Um, the uh, the CSI, ATSI lists, whatever the case may be, you're on that list, that school is, or you can get your class size down to less than 18 students per teacher. So less than 18 means 17. 
Now, the one thing I would say to you is you start, you might start that way. And I talked to a district the other day that second week of school, I think they told me they got 30 new kids in their, their elementary. Okay. They might have to make that 18 go a little bit higher, right? As the school year started, they're a month into school. You're not going to say, oh, you're the class size reduction teacher. So we're always going to keep you low. You would want to keep that teacher low as possible because hopefully you put some needy kids in that classroom as well. But don't make the other classrooms have 30 while that one teacher has 17. Okay. Tate, did I miss anything you want to add for Title II before we go to three? I think you covered everything. Thank you. Awesome. Dolly. You bet. And now to Julie. Hello. I'm going to share with you some Title III information and uh, Title III in two areas, Title III for EL and then Title III for immigrant education. So first is Title III with um, EL. And first of all, we have to figure out what the definition of an English learner is. And that would be somebody who answers a language other than English on the home language survey. And then the second part of that is they would qualify through an EL screener. And on the home language survey, there's three questions that are important to ask. And that is what language did the students first learn to speak? What language is spoken most often by the student? And what language is primarily used in the student's home regardless of the language spoken by the students? Now, what's important about the home language survey is that it should be given to every single student that enrolls in a school district not just a student that may speak a different language, but every single student that enrolls should be given the home language survey. So then when you think about the grant then, what do we do with English language learners, the EL portion? And there are some required uses of the funds. There are three areas that, that um, the grant needs to fund. One is the language instruction education program. And I think on the grant, the pull down for it, the function code is 02, so the instruction side of it. Then professional development for multilinguals, and that would be um, the pull down on the grant is 10, I believe. And then the third one is parent, family, and community engagement for multilingual learners. And that is 09, or number nine on the pull down. So those are the areas for Title III for EL. Then the next area is immigrant education. And immigrant education, um, I know that it kind of fluctuates across the state for districts who receive funding or they don't receive funding. And the reason that is, is because um, there's some certain rules that come with it. And so the numbers of students are tracked for two years. So you take the two year average and then they also, the, uh, to qualify for funding, you also have to have a minimum of 10 students. And the preceding two years, there needs to be a 5% or more increase of students. So for the definition of an immigrant student, an immigrant may be an EL student or they may not be an EL student. I mean, they, they it, it just kind of varies. But for an immigrant, they're ages three to 21 and they're not born in any state or territory of the United States, and they haven't attended school in any state for more than three academic years. And then the allowable uses for immigrant education are um, linked right there. But basically, um, when you think about it, it's for uh, family literacy or EL classes for parents, community engagement, recruitment of individuals, um, working with uh, personnel, working with um, immigrant education students, tutoring, mentoring, or academic uh, work with them, curricular instruction or materials, basic instructional services and activities with the community, um, within the community. So those are the uses for immigrant education. And it is in the chat, the, the link so that yes. they can get to it. Thanks for doing that. Okay, now we're gonna go on to Title 4A, which is student support and academic enrichment. And you'll hear me repeat a lot of what Dottie 
said about 2A because there's a lot of similarities in the general rules between Title II and Title IVa. Um, again, it should be a student focused and it has to be supplemental to any local and state requirements. It really needs to match your plan that you have and also it needs to be reasonable and necessary. Also with the non-publics, non-publics, anything that's allowable for the public in Title IVa is also available for the non-public as a potential use. So there's no nothing like in 2A where you can't do class size reduction and stuff like that. So everything that's listed as allowable is allowable for the private schools as well, as long as everything is secular, non-ideological, and neutral. So we've got a couple links in the PowerPoint that are also, I believe, being put in the chat, but this will also be made available to you. We have our Nebraska Department of Ed Title IV a fact sheet that has a lot of good information about it, talks about some of the allowability that we'll also talk about today. And then there's the United States Department of Education guidance. And I really like this because they've done a really good job of explaining the three areas that we'll talk about that are in Title IVa and give some examples. And a lot of times you'll hear us talk about the three buckets or the three parts of Title IVa. There's well-rounded education, safe and healthy students, and effective technology. And as we go through the next few slides, we'll talk about each of them. So on the next slide, we start with well-rounded education. And these are just some of the examples of what's allowable under well-rounded education. It's not fully inclusive of everything because it's a pretty broad program across all of Title IVa. But some of the keys we've listed on this page, we're looking at seeing districts that may not have some of the programs listed here, like maybe in the past you've had to cut a foreign language program, you're looking for ways to start one up again, these funds could help you do that. Or if you want to expand, they can help you with that as well. We've seen a lot of that, especially with art and music, and in many cases, STEM as well, and CTE. Also, it's to provide access to advanced placement, you know, IB classes, dual credit opportunities. And the focus here is really for what a lot of these programs are about, it's more the kids that are living in poverty or really need needs and don't aren't able as a family to access these anyway. But this is really good and available for that. Um, there's also a lot of what we see with counseling, but it's mostly at the high school level, providing those post-secondary opportunities. So maybe it's expanding a counseling program, or maybe it's adding a new counselor if you don't have one. The focus they really push is on that financial aid awareness, college prep awareness, and also financial literacy to get students ready for college. Similar to the access, we can also use these funds to help reimburse low-income students for examination fees. So if they're going to take an the ACT, SAT, or any other type of te academic test that has examination fees, we can use the Title IVa funds to assist with that. And then any of the programs listed, like the foreign language arts, that whole group, professional development for the teachers to help that. Because if we're adding a new program or expanding, there's probably going to be a need for professional development to go above and beyond what we've already received. And so on the next slide, we'll talk about the safe and healthy students and some of those. And again, like the first part of Well-Rounded, this is not all inclusive. These are just some ideas and suggestions that are out there. Drug and violence prevention activities and programs, programs to educate students, you know, we're trying to get students not to use alcohol, tobacco, e-cigarettes, or any type of tobacco products. So if we don't have programs in place, we can add, add new programs or enhance the ones we have already. When we look at the mental health part of safe and healthy students, some of the areas that we can maybe add to or start in our schools or trauma-informed practices, bullying prevention, 
Title IV-A can start with dropout or reentry programs for school districts. And then along with these and what other things are called out in Title IV is providing that professional development in many of these same areas. And like we have four of them here, where we talk about we can provide PD for suicide prevention, conflict resolution, human trafficking, and sexual abuse awareness. So all of these are important things. And to kind of go back again, some of these things we're starting to see more state and local rules about this and requirements. If it's a state and local requirement, we cannot use these funds to pay for it. But we could use them if we are going above and beyond the state requirement. And then the last section on the next page, effective use of technology. And I really like to point out the title of this is those first two words, effective use. We have a lot of people that really want to buy technology and they think this is a good place to do it. And really, that's not the goal of this program. It's really a goal to train our staff to make sure the technology we have that they have the professional development and the understanding to use this equipment, software, hardware that goes along with it. So we're really pushing for that professional development in that area, you know, working on finding effective or innovative strategies, especially to deliver rigorous courses through te technology or rigorous coursework and things we already have going on. This part can also be used to carry out blended learning projects. There's a big focus on rural and remote areas or underserved areas. This can be used to build up the resources to take advantage of this, where we may have students that can't you know, access the internet and a lot of their assignments on the internet. And at the bottom, we have a really good reminder of an infrastructure percentage. And the key is this is only for these items bought under effective use of technology. You might buy technological things and are well-rounded or safe and healthy. Those technological pieces of hardware and sophomore software do not come into this rule. It's just that portion of your funds that go to the effective use of technology section. Of those, no more than 15% of the funds in the effective use of technology may be used for the infrastructure. And then we get the question of what is infrastructure? And the Department of Education has defined that as infrastructure includes devices, equipment, software, and digital content. So when you look at that, that effective use of technology is only gonna be a part of your monies, especially if you're over 30,000 and have to meet the 20% requirements and are safe and healthy and well-rounded, 15% is not a lot of money for most districts in this area. So we just wanna remind people, we have ran into a couple things already as we've started looking at applications where our non-publics, all they wanna do is you buy technology with this and the district doesn't have a large enough percentage to meet that 15%. So the private schools are having, gonna have to use, look at other ways to use this as well. And we also get the question with the non-public schools on Title IV is on those districts that received more than 30,000, do the private schools have to do the 20%, 20% and something in effective use of technology? And the answer is no. It is the combined amount because really the private schools are getting services, they're not getting funded. So the 20% rules and then this 15% rule inside of effective use of technology is for the total amount of public and private together. So Tate, what you're saying then is if I wanted to get a 3D printer that goes with something in my shop um, to work with the shop kids and it's a program, I that would be allowed under well-rounded and I wouldn't have to put it under effective use of technology? That's a good, good example of how you can work with that. We don't okay. want you to, you know, intentionally try to avoid this 15%, but there are legitimate ways like Dottie's example. But yeah, anything under well-rounded and safe and healthy does not qualify for this 15%.
That's okay. a great example. And, Thank you. and Tate, there's a couple more questions in the chat. So can they use Title IV for uh, social emotional behavioral learning? They're thinking of using the funds for screening so they can offer good social emotional support. Yes, it's a, if it's above and beyond what's already happening in the district, that is perfectly acceptable. Fantastic. And then the next question is, can Title II or Title IV be used to purchase translating aids such as earbuds? So do you want to answer that for Title II and Title IV? Yep. Title II, that answer is easy. That's a no. Title IV, I'd probably have to look into it a little more, but I would lean towards saying yes. But and it just kind of depends on how they're being used, what program they're being used. But anytime you have questions and it's something that, you know, seems good, like that sounds like a really good use, you know, definitely ask us and we'll look into that and help you make a decision. Our goal is always to reach yes if it's necessary and reasonable, and we'll make sure it's allowable too, because those are the three keys on everything. Awesome. Thank you, Tade. All right. Um, a little bit on transferability. Um, with the ESSA program or ESSA grants, Title I, Title II, and Title IV, everybody gets. Title III and Title IV or Title III EL and Title III IE are going to be based on the number of students that are identified. And a lot of those um, are in consortias. The thing with transferability is Title I, Title III, and the Title III grants cannot be transferred out. You can transfer in, but you can't transfer out. Um, with Title II and Title IV, those are the two that are very fluid. So you could move Title II to Title I or Title IV. You could also move Title IV to Title I or Title II. Um, the big thing is if you transfer, you have to transfer the full amount. And once it's transferred, it takes on the program that you've transferred to all of the the characteristics of that program. So if you are transferring Title IV to Title II, that is now only going to be used for professional development or class size reduction for the public. It cannot be used um, for anything that's allowable in Title IV. It, it just, it basically, you're, you're transferring, it now takes on the identification of that grant. Um, I think that's it on, title, on the transferability, but if there's any questions, we can get to that afterwards. We wanted to give you a few reminders. The ESSA consolidated applications are due no later than 1159 on September 30th. So that date is coming up very quickly. Um, we want to make sure you get your grants submitted because if you don't, then you have to go through the process of submitting data late, filling out the form, getting it approved by a committee. We don't want to mess with that. So just make sure you get your grants in uh, by September 30th. Then we have some deadlines coming up on the ARP ESSER funds. You must obligate those funds by September 30th again <laughs> this month. Um, and then those reimbursements need to be submitted by November 15th. The ARP HCY 1 and 2 funds also have the September 30 deadline. So <laughs> mark in your calendar a big red, <laughs> everything needs to be done by September 30th. Um, on committing those funds, having them obligated for the ESSER and the, the ARP HCY funds, and then making sure you get your grant in by September 30th for the ESSA. Um, I see there's a question, but we'll come back to it in just a minute. Um, this is our contacts for the team, um, which of the ESU areas everybody works with, their phone number and email addresses. And then I'm the final reviewer on all the grants. So um, I'm, I, you're welcome to co contact any of us. If we get a call from someone that's not in our area, we will still take it and we'll still help you. Um, but these are your main contacts. Those are the people that will be reviewing your grant. And those are the people when it comes to monitoring, that will be monitoring your grant or your, your district. So I want to make sure you have those contacts. And then I think that's it for, um, our presentation, but we will take questions. And um, then if there's anyone that needs any time to for breakout rooms, we will offer that also. So 